Um, my name is Leonie Wheeler and I am the Honorary um, CEO of the Australian Learning Communities Network. Thank you very much for being here and I'm delighted to be your MC for today's uh, webinar. I'd especially like to thank uh, Melton City Council, the City of Port Adelaide Enfield, uh, Wyndham City Council, Pascal International Observatory and the University of South Australia and other local governments in South Australia for supporting this webinar. And uh, to begin today, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land from which we all come and where learning takes place across Australia and globally. I particularly acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation who are the traditional owners uh, where I am from. I acknowledge the richness that our Aboriginal community members bring to our lands across Australia and the globe and their learning that has been passed across generations for thousands of years. And I would like to invite you to tell us where you are from, where you are joining from today in the chat. Thank you. Uh, so to introduce this webinar today while you're doing that, this webinar will showcase the practical education for sustainable development work of the UNESCO Learning City of Melton, Victoria, alongside initiatives from Port Adelaide Enfield and the Living Lightly Locally project in South Australia, which partnered with the Burnside and Mount Barker councils in South Australia. And I'd like to let you know that the learning forum is happening in the context of the sixth international conference on learning cities, which is taking place in the UNESCO learning city of Jabal, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, on the 3rd and 4th of December this year. The theme is learning cities at the forefront of climate action and UNESCO learning cities from around the world will discuss strategies for promoting climate action through lifelong learning. In fact, I've been invited to an ASEAN Region Learning Cities Conference next year, where I, next week actually, on Monday, when I will be talking about um, the work of the Australian Learning Communities Networks and Learning Cities. So this is very timely. Uh, and I'm really pleased that this forum will showcase the practical work that you're all doing. Our speakers today have extensive experience running and researching climate resilience, sustainability and regeneration through community education and action. Each presenter will have about 10 to 15 minutes and we've got a fairly small audience so you'll have time at the end to ask a question or we will have a Q&A answer at the end of the presentations as well so you'll have another chance to do it. And of course our student uh, Kashish will take us through a Mentimeter project where you will reflect on what you've learned today. So make sure you've got your ears listening. That's very important. Well, the first speaker now uh, it gives me much pleasure to introduce um, Sylvia Valles, who will speak on the role of libraries in promoting environmental literacy, reflections on the 2024 Melton Learning Festival. You can read Sylvia's extensive CV in the chat, but it has been my pleasure to um, visit Sylvia out in the field. She is always coming up with new and innovative ideas for residents to enjoy. Over to you, Sylvia. Thanks, Leonie, and thanks everyone. Um, there's a, a lot of work in organizing these webinars and um, it's a great network, so thanks for those attending and thanks for those behind all the machinery organizing it. I'm going to share my screen now. Can someone? Oh, I won't be able to know if you're seeing it or not. So Sharon, you might be able to see me. Tell me. Yeah, looks good. Yeah, so okay. yeah thanks. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to um, just briefly talk about the Learning Festival this year. It's a festival that we have every year. Um, but this year was special in terms of the theme, which was about sustainability. Um, for, let me just see, I need to go forward. Okay, for those um, of you that are not um, in Victoria or in Melbourne, I'll give you a quick snapshot of our city first. Um, here you see on the left, the map of the city of Melton. 
And on the right, um, I would also like to acknowledge that we are in the land of the of three traditional owners in Milton, the Wurundjeri people, the Wadawurrung and the Banarong. And um, we also um, think about the teaching and learning of the elders that have done so much in terms of, of climate um, protection and have really looked after our land. So um, we acknowledge that as well. Um, on the left, you'll see the city of Melton has two very um, big dense areas in the east and the west side. And all that area in the middle is being developed. So it is a fast growing city. Um, and if you're further away from Melton, from Melbourne, you can see how we are placed in the map of Victoria in relation to Melbourne. So we're um, neighbours with Wyndham and Brimbank and um, almost on the very edge of the, the western edge of the city. So, so a quick snapshot of our city. Um, we have a population from last year's um, data of 206,000 and an annual growth of 6.6%, which is incredible. Um, we are the fa second fastest growing LGA. I suspect Wyndham might take the first place on this one. And um, not that we're competing, but the maternal and child health team love to tell us that they have about 50 new babies every week. So it is growing very fast and mostly in that young family um, demographic. We're also culturally very diverse. 36% um, of our population was born overseas from over 160 countries. And very importantly for our role in libraries, 39% speak a language other than English at home. So fast growing, a lot of diversity, and obviously a lot of opportunities for um, learning and for education. We are a learning city um, and the city of Milton adopted the first community learning plan back in 1998. And we were also awarded a UNESCO Lifelong Learning City Award in um, 2015. And we offer regular and special learning opportunities across our two library branches and all the community centers, which are spread all over the municipality. It's a very, a very big area. But the Learning Festival is a yearly event and um, it's aligned with Adult Learners Week um, in September and all the events are free um, for, a, for all and are for all ages and all abilities. So the, the, we, we do um, really think about that. The concepts from UNESCO of lifelong, life-wide and life-deep learning. Um, this, we, uh, and the team, we love this shot from the last Learning Festival opening day um, where this little girl was just so absolutely engaged with her book. It was fantastic. And um, this is another of, of our favourite photographs. Um, the branding was very much about celebrating wonder, curiosity, fun, um, knowledge and learning. And that came about really through um, finding through a bit of engagement that the word learning was not always a positive one for people, which is always surprising. And when we are in the learning space, we, we're all learners and we love learning. But if you've had a, um, a bad educational experience, learning might not be the best um, word to use. So we were trying to underpin all our programs with a sense of, of fun. So the planning process that started the festival this year started with us having a fair bit of um, internal consultation to try and come up with the priorities. And we started joining all these dots. One of them, for example, was that um, we have high waste cross contamination. That's that's a big ongoing problem for the waste team where people just don't know what goes in each recycling bin or might not know the importance of doing that sorting ahead of the pickup of the of the bins. Um, we also found, for example, that um, there's resistance to purchasing secondhand goods, um, and there's a feeling that it might be um, they might be not as nice as new clothes or as new um, household items that might be in good working order. 
We've also heard from a lot of local teachers expressing how difficult it is to develop, to deliver the environmental curriculum. And so we've been thinking about how can we support and complement that, um, which is um, in Victoria, it is one of the subjects that's embedded in all, in all subjects. So it's a bit everywhere and nowhere all at once. And, um, and we had also the internal landscaping teams with them um, talking to us about how it's hard, there's a lot of resistance to the new tree plantings and our lack of tree canopy. If you've been out in the West, you'll see how it was a farming area with very little trees, um, contributes over three degrees in temperatures compared to the city. So three degrees hotter in summer because of trees and three degrees colder in winter because of lack of insulation. So those were some of the sort of um, points that came up in, in discussions with different teams internally. And then we also had um, ongoing conversations about um, reconciliation and the, and the role of First Nations in, in this space. Um, we found in activities at Sorry Day, for example, that the CALD community was very keen on understanding more about First Nations um, history and traditions as well. So those were our sort of dots in terms of planning. And then I came across, like these things happen, serendipity. Um, Zena Kamsten had a fantastic opening speech where she was started her um, conference saying, sustainability and reconciliation are two sides of the same coin. So that for us was sort of the, the beginning, the beginning inspiration of, of the planning. Um, the themes that we identified then across um, several departments was um, energy efficiency, uh, food waste in terms of cooking and promoting gardening and promoting zero waste cooking, biodiversity and um, promoting the understanding of our local environment and um, native flora and fauna. Um, we wanted to do something with fast fashion um, and with young people as well in terms of making um, re eco fashioning available. General environmental literacy, what does it mean to talk about climate change and climate justice and um, sustainability? And also have a lot of recycling ideas with crafts and toys and activities for children. But the key message underpinning all of these events was that there is hope because we also found out that young people are, particularly young people, but I think it's across all demographics, are suffering from a lot of climate anxiety. So we wanted to make sure that people felt hopeful about choices that they could take that would be impactful and that would translate as well to um, financially um, viable choices. So um, teaching and promoting actions that um, were good for your back pocket for the wallet. Um, the launch was a great success and I just quickly have a picture here of the flags that were um, on a very windy Milton day um, that were celebrating the, the launch at the library. And we invited um, a number of local businesses to support them. Um, they had to, we had an EOI that went out with EcoDev to um, get local businesses to tell us how they were sustainable. We had author talks, a lot of entertainment and workshops. Um, a couple of different things that we tried this year was a sketch and chat where participants would sit down for a five minute portrait by one of the artists, uh, a local artist. And, and then while they chatted, we would capture um, ideas that they had to put in their learning bucket list and answer some questions about sustainability. And a very successful little um, event, a uh, little um, gadget that we had was an eco passport that we gave children. So they had to go around to all the exhibitors and get stamped um, so that they would engage with questions um, with everyone. On an average Saturday at the library in Milton, we have maybe 520 visitors. And that opening day, we had 1,700. So it was definitely nearly 1,800. So it was definitely a, a very good activation and celebration of, of learning. We had lots of roaming activities during the day. We wanted it to be very festive and ongoing. So you didn't have to, um, mostly you didn't have to book. So you could come in, drop in at any time. 
We tried to place exhibitors and businesses in all parts of the library, so disrupt a bit the age group um, space that, the, you know, if you're in libraries, you know that we have a children's area and a fiction area and reference area. So we wanted people to visit all areas. And we staggered the programs during the day and during the week. The festival ran for a week and we had over 40 programs that week so that people could go to several things and not feel like they had to choose between one or another. Um, and we had lots of giveaways as well. Um, so, for example, this is our wonderful um, Samoan Phoebe um, Cacao that gave up. Um, she's she's has a in she's um, in Samoa. She uh, supports a cacao farm that is fair trade and um, certified organic and has best practices in terms of sustainability. So she was giving out samples. They use the husk of the cacao, which usually is thrown away to make a special tea. Um, so that was really interesting for a lot of people who haven't had cacao husk tea before, myself included. Um, we had fridge magnets with tips and um, people can just have that daily reminder of things that they can do to make a difference. We had bookmarks that were illustrated by local artists with watercolors of local birds. They were gorgeous. Um, and then different guides, recipe cards and um, little veg, vegetable and fruit seeds to, um, to plant. So all of, every patron had a got a bag with seeds um, to plant. So those were some of the giveaways. And then we tried to embed sustainability in the program delivery itself. So having materials that could be reused or recycled or compostable, having minimal rubbish produced. I mean, often these events, we, we have to really think about how we, we do them. If we have food and coffee and all that, to have containers that are um, low impact and promoting sustainable sustainable methods all along. For example, we built we had a sensory room that was built with cushions made um, by the craft group with secondhand clothes. So um, get a pencil skirt at Vinnie's, stitch up both sides, and you've got a cushion. And so that was that was a really fun room, and it was used quite a bit that day. Um, I'm going to show you quickly how we're going for time. Okay, yeah. I've got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to show you some of the um, images of our facilitators. Um, this this is a group called Haiti Ho, and they especially did sustainability songs and performances, so they had everyone dancing. Um, here's one of our um, program officers, Pete, collecting learning stories while the person sitting there would be sketched. And so this was a setup, like a bit of a podcast setup. Um, that was very popular as well. Um, this is Ka um, Caroline from Little Sprouts. Um, her workshops on planting where, um, you know, kids love gardening. You get children into gardening and we probably will solve lots of problems if they, if they just learn how to plant and how to uh, look after plants. These were very, very well attended as well. Um, and that's one of the portraits being sketched. Um, by Florence, the artist, the local artist. And Envirocom has always um, had a great relationship with us and they deliver a lot of environmental programs. And here they have a game where they have all the different beans and um, you can use the beans to see what goes where. Um, so that's a great educational um, activity. And the um, a stand that we had with with uh, representatives from Asian Australians for Climate Solutions. They had an amazing engagement um, talking to people about their group and their advocacy projects and campaigns. And there that day, their membership nearly doubled, um, which they were very pleased to report. Um, so that's a growing group in the West. Here we have someone um, boy on the left um, doing some knitting with these um, little sticks that did little um, hanging and uh, wall hangings and then the honey tasting on the right which is um, very popular our, our honey our local honey and of course uh, every time people talked about the honey then they would talk about the bees and plants that are bee friendly 
Um, and we had some author talks. Ultra Wild was very successful with Steve Mushin. If anyone wants to get him on board, he does these um, very uh, creative and fun um, workshops to imagine a better future. And it's for all ages. We had um, from five-year-olds to um, seniors, everyone involved in drawing and imagining different ways of ultra wilding a, an urban space. And we had a very practical one from Tim Forsey, um, who has a Facebook group that is has hundreds of thousands of people called My Efficient Electric um, Home Handbook. And he gave us books as well to hand out. And um, that's we've had ongoing feedback that that's been a really good resource. So um, we are in a place, I guess, we trialed all these programs and the hope is that we can really keep, you know, take them from being a festival program to being an ongoing um, offering because we are a space that is trusted for information and in, in um, environmental literacy and climate um, debates, there's always so much um, distrust and politicized areas and so I think our community does trust us to give them the best information. This is a picture of our beautiful library that celebrated 10 years last year and it was the first library in Australia to be awarded a five green star rating. Um, so the library itself is is uh, environmentally friendly and the other branches as well and um, we hope to just keep having these programs as part of the regular programs. Um, especially the ones that worked the best because it takes more than a festival um, to address all the um, challenges in environmental literacy. But we saw that there is definitely an appetite for learning and doing the right thing. And so it's, it was a hopeful festival. Um, that's the end of my um, that's it, that's it. presentation. And I think I'm on time to, uh, I don't know, Sharon, would we have time to um, um, think some questions or maybe at the end? I think um, we'll take some time at the end, uh, um, Sylvia, um, but I'll just sum up really uh, about what you, what I felt is an incredible range of, of um, activities you're doing. And I like the way you set challenges, your community challenges at the beginning. What are the issues that we need to discuss? That's really important. That's a learning city approach to take, look at the challenges that your city as a, a fast growing city, and we know it had a lot of grasslands and those native grasslands were important. They, um, you know, that a lot of animals live in those grasslands. And and um, so we need to think about that as well. And the, the tree canopy is another thing that you talked about and getting people to think about these issues, not as, oh, the end of the world is near, but a hopeful and celebratory way of doing it, I really la liked. And the fact that you were building cultural bridges and doing it, and the fact that, you know, you had a, an increased membership in the Asian Australian community was wonderful. And I also like your partnership with Samoa, the, that business, the Kaukau business, and we talked about rural urban partnerships, that we mustn't forget the that we come from a rural community and rural people in an island like Samoa, even our, our farmers on the outskirts of our city have a lot to teach us. And um, you, in, you involve business providers as well and small business providers and you know, honey, as well as teaching about the bees. And um, and I think that point about being a trusted um, provider of information is one I'll take away with me because that's absolutely critical that we need places that are trusted places for information. And the final point I'll make is a measure of a learning city is if you can take short term programs in a learning festival and make them long term. A lot of academics have written about that. And so I think that idea of, of you being um, a long term, um, uh, wanting to, these programs to happen long term is absolutely critical. So thanks very much for, um, for that talk. And if anyone has any questions to Sylvia while our next speaker is going, just put it in the chat and I'll note it down for our Q&A time. Um, so now we have pleasure in um, introducing Dr. Kerry Hopewood, 
um, University of South Australia researcher and educator specialising in regenerative, regenerative living beyond sustainability. Now we are so pleased to have an academic from the University of South Australia and as you can see in the chat, her CV is very extensive. She holds a doctorate in anthropology, social inquiry from the University of Adelaide. Importantly, Kerry has worked on so many climate, climate action projects and today we'll speak about living lightly, lightly, locally, an alliteration, smarter and stronger through citizen science. Over to you, Kerry. Thank you so much, Leonie, and thank you for the invitation to be here and to everyone who has come along. Um, also, thanks to Sylvia for an amazing presentation. It's um, funny you should lead into it by saying that you're looking for longer term and embedding longer term programs. Um, that's just what Living Lightly Locally is all about. Um, I should mention the change in the title of my presentation. Um, we are now moving into the second phase of this program where we're going to be calling it um, Living Lightly Locally for Regenerative Regions. And I'll note that some people out there might actually know me as Kerry Shiverals, which was my former name, um, but I changed my name uh, in 2020 um, when I got married, very much because I believe so strongly uh, in what Sylvia was saying about the need for hope. Um, and my husband's uh, last name, he also changed his name with marriage because we wanted to push back against patriarchal conventions and his last name used to be Ward. So we added hope because we want to head Hopewood together and we believe that hope is so important. And when I talk about hope, I don't mean the kind of hope that comes from denial of how dire some of the challenges are that we're facing into the future with this poly crisis or from delusion, thinking that we can just solve them by being hopeful. I mean, the kind of hope that can rest you from despair because you're taking action, active hope. So that's what this program is all about. Um, before I start, it's really important um, as always to acknowledge that Living Lightly Locally is a project that's taken place so far on the lands of the Ghana, Paramount and Naranjiri people. I'd like to extend my respect to elders past, present and emerging, as well as to any First Nations people who are joining us today. And it's really important, obviously, when we think about what it means to live lightly locally, to acknowledge the role played by First Nations people in caring for country since time uh, immemorial. And I'd like to invite us all uh, to reflect on our own roles in contributing to processes of decolonization as we embark on this discussion together today, but also on our learning journeys going forward from here. Um, I just included in the background there, um, that's an image that's taken from my window here where I'm sitting, that beautiful land. And earlier on today, I was in a forum with Ayla, um, the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, um, talking about bioregionalism, and we were invited to acknowledge country in the chat, like you've all been invited to do so. And I was just about to type in that I was joining from Ghana land, and I looked down at my feet, and there was a leaf in the shape of a kangaroo there. <laughs> I thought it was quite beautiful, so I added that today. Um, so this is our research team um, who've been working, I've had the privilege of working with on Living Lightly Locally for the last few years. Um, you can see it's quite a cross-disciplinary team. I'm also working with my husband, um, James Hopewood, who, you know, approaches the um, areas of passion that we share, but from a very different lens, mine being social science and anthropology and his being modelling and environmental engineering. But we've got a whole host of expertise from different researchers on the team, um, including our master's student, Matilda Raines, at the end there, who you'll hear more about shortly. So thank you to everyone um, who's been part of this project so far. So just to give you um, a bit of context as to where this project is sitting at the moment. So the first phase of the project was funded um, federally under a citizen science research grant, um, which is why it was called Living Lightly Locally Smarter, referring to smart goal setting processes and stronger through citizen science. So that's already been funded. And during those years, we were able to develop the core educational materials for the program we were able to trial our research data gathering mechanisms and we were also able to deliver two local pilots um, that were that took place in our um, partner funding council region, so Mount Barker and Burnside. And we're now in a really exciting 
position. You can um, you might have noticed the race for 2030 in the top corner of the slides there, um, where we have um, support from a race for 2030, um, that's federal funding again, Cooperative Research Centre, who've said they're keen to support this project into phase two, that's for the next few years. And they've even flagged potential to support this program all the way up to 2030. So we're in quite a rare position of having um, the potential for some ongoing funding and to develop this program over time, which we know is often an issue in this field, um, having short-term funding. So during this current second phase of the program, uh, where it's living lightly locally for regenerative regions, we're interested in learning lessons that we can learn from the two very small pilots that we ran in Burnside and Mount Barker and thinking about how we can create the kind of curriculum that works really well to meet local needs um, but is able to be scaled up. And we're looking at doing that through co-delivery and co-design, um, working with centres like Sylvia's centres, uh, like environment centres, community hubs and local libraries. And during the second phase, we'll be doing that with um, more uh, regions within South and across South Australia. And then the aim of that is to trial the scaling of the program so that during the third phase, we could potentially be rolling it out into state um, and even potentially nationally. So that's the context of the program. But what is Living Lightly Locally, you might ask? <laughs> well, it's um, a free, 12-month adult research and education program and it's designed to encourage people to live more sustainably and regeneratively while also helping create more resilient and regenerative local regions. And it's called Living Lightly Locally because we understand that the challenges um, for living lightly um, vary depending on where you live. They're all different locally and that's not something that's always recognised in the research. And what do our participants do during this program? Well, one of the innovative things about the program is um, it can, commences with participants envisioning the local future that they want to see. I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with the work of Damon Gamo and Regenerating Australia. I wish I could see people's hands. <laughs> if you're not familiar with it, absolutely check it out. Um, Regenerating Australia's fantastic documentary um, where people, um, Basically, he takes people back on a journey from Australia in 2030 that is living in a more regenerative way uh, using actual solutions that are out there. So it comes back to not being delusional about what's possible, um, but looking at where we're actually at and where we want to get to. So we introduce people first to the concepts of planetary boundaries and constraints. Um, what are some of the barriers that we have to work within if we are going to live sustainably and regeneratively on this planet. And then we guide people through a visioning process as to what their local region looks like at some point in the future where they've managed to successfully navigate those barriers and constraints. And then those visions are captured by a local artist and sent out to all of the participants um, so that they're inspired to help bring those visions to life. And we then introduce participants to a different topic each month uh, using documentary films that we've created that feature people like Damon Gamo, like Helen and Orberg Hodge from Local Futures, members of the research team talking about the research in relation to those topics, but then also and importantly, people we call are living lightly locally legends who are um, already in action on the ground, um, yeah, in charge of initiatives that are helping bring this future into being already. And then the idea is that those films help um, inspire participants to set goals um, to bring these visions to life and then we follow their journeys over the course of 12 months and ask them to contribute data from their own journey um, via mechanisms uh, that are of interest to them so that that can be surveys self audits and diaries for each topic this is an example of a couple of the visions that were produced um, during the program you can see how much detail is actually in there um, it's almost like a, a storybook snapshot of the conversation that we've had um, about the future people are, are wanting to create in their local region. And these are the different monthly topics that we cover. Um, so in the introductory um, topic, we start off with a fairly conventional ecological footprint assessment, um, but we also introduce that with a critical lens, so letting people know that 
um, there are issues with these sorts of tools and it's not necessarily going to accurately capture their own experiences. But what we really want to hear um, over the course of their journey is whether or not they feel that, that um, the story that's told through those conventional assessments when they repeat it at the end in your journey uh, is accurate and what are, the, what are the differences that we can draw out from their own stories of change. So we cover all these different topics and then they reflect again on the visions that they created on their EFAs at the end. And you can see a dotted point there um, because some of our participants were so inspired from the first pilot that they enrolled straight into the second pilot and wanted to continue their journey again, which was just lovely to see. Um, so here are some of the key outcomes um, from the first phase. So we've created 12 30 minute um, educational videos that you heard me speak about before. We've um, managed to gather some wonderful local case studies um, of action that's taking place on the ground. Um, we established our data collection mechanisms, curated extra resources, of course, for people in terms of extra reading and information. We delivered the two pilots. So overall, we had about 50 participants in total. Um, and I know that's not a lot, certainly not compared to the numbers that Sylvia presented, but it was deliberately designed um, to only have a small number of participants because we were really looking to draw out rich um, stories and rich case studies from really engaged participants about their experiences. And then one of the other really great outcomes from this program is our Masters by Research project that we put up as soon as we got initial funding for the program, um, which has been carried out by Matilda Raines and she's just submitted it for examination, which is fantastic news. So I can't talk too much about the outcomes because they're being examined now, but watch this space. She will be publishing um, her results. So her program was called Changing, I mean, sorry, her project was called Changing the World for Good, Mapping the Long-Term Impacts of Adult Community Environmental Education Programs in South Australia. So obviously a topic of relevance to people here. And the idea was that this program would also help inform evaluation and program development of Living Lightly Locally into the second phase. So Tilly's program um, had a main case study, which was the Living Smart program. How many people have heard of the Living Smart program? Fantastic program that's been delivered often in partnership with local governments all across Australia for many years now. Um, it's a great program that helps pe kickstart people's journeys of sustainability. Um, so it's been delivered here in South Australia or administered by Green Adelaide for a number of years, um, but yet has amazing outcomes, but very different to Living Lightly Locally in that it's usually delivered in about eight weeks and is a rapid sort of kickstart for people to continue their journey, whereas ours is more long-term and patient and hoping people can really delve into the details of each topic over a longer period of time and that we can learn from them about what are the barriers and enablers and unexpected trade-offs that happen when they make change in a particular area. So Tilly's been looking at Living Smart, also informed by Australian Red Cross Climate Ready Communities Program. Has anyone heard of that here? It's a great program. You can see the research questions on the side um, there. So the idea is that the learnings from those program will also inform Living Lightly Locally, as I said. Um, so some of the findings from phase one of Living Lightly Locally, um, which we're also writing up at the moment, are that the visioning process was absolutely inspirational for most of the participants. Some of them became quite evangelical about the vision that they created. Um, we had one participant who said, I've stuck it on the back of my front door so every single person who comes into or out of my house has to have a conversation with me about it. Um, and uh, yeah, I get to talk to them about the program and try and encourage them to enrol. So that's been wonderful. It's also really interesting because we ran and practiced this visioning process, um, not only with our participants, but at a number of public events, including the Planet Local Summit that we were invited to speak at in Bristol in the UK last year. So we we're invited to speak about this program as a case study of localization. And we ran this program there. And what was really interesting is that even across so many different countries, backgrounds, and locations, a lot of the key um, elements of these visions were very, very similar. <laughs> so it seems like we know where we want to head. The challenge is how do we get there? 
Um, and that's really what we're interested in focusing in on during the second phase of Living Lightly Locally is how can we create an enabling policy and systemic environment to support people implementing changes locally? What are the barriers? What are best practice examples from around Australia in this space? Um, we developed a mapping um, tool as well as part of this, which we think has a lot of potential to be a lot more useful in um, future phases. Um, we noticed that there are actually quite a number of issues with some very well-established and well-recognised tools in relation to sustainability. Um, a lot of issues emerge with the data and the way that people use them. And interestingly, what we found was despite that and despite grounding it in critique, people who participated in and used these tools tended to believe them even if the results didn't make any sense in relation to their own personal experiences. Um, for example, we had a participant who was implementing so many changes in their local community and in their life, and when they revisited their EFA, none of that showed up. And they said, oh, I feel terrible. I feel terrible about my experience. I obviously haven't done enough, right? Uh, we were trying to point out, you've obviously done a lot. <laughs> it's just not showing up. Um, in these tools. So I think there's a tendency in our culture, uh, or at least in mainstream and academic culture, to value quantitative measures over people's actual experiences and actual stories. And that's something we want to challenge by bringing people's stories to the fore. So that's the focus of our program. We also found that people tended to gravitate towards, um, in terms of the goal setting, towards things they could do directly, things that were right in front of them. Um, turning off the water at the tap um, rather than thinking about more indirect impacts. And that was even when the program was explaining these different levels to them. Um, but when they were encouraged to set goals at the community and systems change levels, they were super, super keen to do it. Um, so that's very encouraging and suggests that if we can design the program into the second phase to really focus on that systemic change, um, we might get a lot more happening as well. Um, goal setting was hit and miss. <laughs> it worked for some people, but not for others. And a lot of people who said, no, it didn't work for me, I didn't like doing it, then in retrospect would sort of say, actually, I set this goal and I might not have written it down, but it's what I've achieved and it led me on to do other things. So it is still a useful device, I think, but there's a need for a stronger focus on policy. Um, so in terms of the data, um, there's a need for us to streamline our data gathering mechanisms. We, in the first phase, left it as open as we could because we wanted, we knew people would want to engage in different ways um, and some mechanisms would suit some people but not others. I think that did create a bit of confusion for people though. <laughs> so we want to make sure we streamline those mechanisms into the second phase. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned before, I just really think that highlighting people's stories of change is going to be super important into the future. Um, we're also hoping to build in a more open participation model going forward so that people can move in and out of the program and we can hopefully um, you know, access more participants in that way, um, as well as building in even longer term evaluation. We thought a 12 month program um, by its very nation notion had um, long term evaluation built in, but we would like to be able to come back to people a few years later, even if we have the funding over this longer term period and ask how they're going now. Um, and given the emphasis on storytelling, we're keen to build in training um, for participants in storytelling as well, so that they can learn to tell their stories in ways that inspire others. So that's basically my summary of the program so far, but I wanted to leave us with a couple of like questions to ho hopefully provoke some discussion and because I'm really keen to learn from everyone that we've got in this space as well. So one of the challenges that we ran into was recruitment. I mean, recruitment, it really wasn't bad given what we were looking for, um, but particularly also um, Tilly in her master's program had huge issues with getting the number of people to respond to the surveys or participate in the interviews far, um, far more difficult to find participants than we anticipated. And then I'm sure if anyone's done work in this space or attended these kinds of sessions, um, they'll know there's often a danger of feeling like we're meeting with the usual suspects and like we're talking to the same people. So my question for people is how can we create more diverse participation beyond the usual suspects? Um, I mentioned some of our challenges in terms of the platform for delivering this program. 
Um, so I'm keen to think about how we could develop more intuitive platforms and open, open mechanisms for sharing stories at scale. So if you were a participant in this program, how would you want to share your story? What would work for you? I'm really keen to hear from you all on that. And then funding obviously is an issue for a lot of programs in this space. Um, we've been quite lucky in terms of the funding we've been able to secure, um, but it has taken longer than, um, than we'd planned for. Um, so just a question generally for everyone here, how can we activate together to increase and improve funding for community climate education more broadly? Um, so they're my provocations. I uh, just wanted to uh, highlight a few resources that are available at the moment if people are interested in community and climate education. So these are just snips from the different websites. Um, but Climate for Change is currently running um, climate conversation training. It's free. Um, sounds like a great thing. I've just enrolled in it myself. And then they're going to lead on for people who've done that training. You can become a facilitator as well. And they're running sessions so people can um, learn how to host climate conversations with their MPs. If you're interested in having um, and hosting conversations about climate in your local community, there's a fantastic guide that's put out by Australian Red Cross Climate Ready Communities called the Climate Ready Communities Guide to Getting Started. You can download that for free and it's just got some amazing resources that help you think about how to host that conversation locally. There's the 52 Climate Actions Project that I was part of as well. And I also wanted to flag, I'm not sure how many people in this session are from SA, but an amazing initiative that's popped up from the grassroots um, recently, locally, is the South Australian Grassroots Ecosystem. And they're regularly getting numbers of between 60 and 100 people showing up to these sessions every month, um, taking action collectively together um, for a more resilient and regenerative future. So um, an amazing model that I think a lot of people could learn from. So thank you all so much um, for listening and um, thank you for inviting me to speak, but also a huge thank you to our partners that supported us during this first phase of Living Lightly Locally. So that was Hills and Florio Landscape Board, Green Adelaide, Australian Red Cross, Climate Ready Communities Program and Mount Barker and City of Burnside Council. And if you want to learn more about the program, you can go to our website, livinglightlylocally.com.au. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Kerry. What a, um, a tremendous project you've been involved in, and it's going to take my head uh, some time getting around all the elements of it. <laughs> um, when I was working at RMIT University, I was involved in um, an ARC grant, um, School Community Partnerships for Sustainability, where we um, documented the case studies of 17 uh, good practice schools across Victoria about what they were doing um, to um, address climate change and, and their, uh, improve their energy, get their students working with communities, etc. I was project managing that, and it was just really a lot of work to try and um, get because we went out and we used the most significant change method yeah. of questioning to go out into schools, and we got community members, and we got students, and we got. Um, um, teachers to come and talk to us about what was the most significant um, change from doing this environmental um, project over a, a five-year period and that uh, was just a really magnificent project and yours sounds exactly the same going out and talking yeah. to people but um, to project manage such a project is like um, <laughs> oh, I won't say it is quite a challenge so yeah. I think um, I was very impressed and I think there'll be some Victorian people who might want to pick up your program um, in the uh, when you're in space three I th actually I think we could help re recruit participants for you I'm sure uh, that would be absolutely amazing and in terms of like exploring um, interstate partnerships like it'd be great to even just be patiently having those conversations in the beginning now because the earlier you have an idea of partnering the better able you are to develop the program to make sure it's meeting everybody's needs and is well suited so yeah, yeah because I think our, our people could get you into multicultural and yeah. bilingual communities so I mean I'm talking about that next weekend 
you know, uh, for example, we've got a city in Western Australia that has a cultural ambassadors program where they have 17 um, bilingual, multilingual people who actually go out and talk about issues. And they talk, one of the issues they talk about to their community is waste management. So you could connect with that community and you'd Absolutely, have a really yeah. cultural, um, di culturally diverse community. And of course, Wyndham and, and, and Melton and Victoria are very culturally diverse, so you've got no problems there either. And they do um, work, they, um, they do work in the environment. So I, I hopefully in the future, there'll be opportunities for partnerships. Yeah, I hope so too. I was so inspired to hear Sylvia talking about the um, Asian Australians for Climate Solutions group as well, and to know that there are groups like this forming, and that's really what we'd like to make sure we're empowering people to do and supporting people to do, because yeah, we, we need we need more diverse um, engagement in these issues, and yeah, we, we don't want just the usual suspects coming along to these no, programs well, anymore. Yeah, um, and... these, these communities, these, and it's through mainly libraries, they'll get you into these communities, and as, yeah. as Sylvia said, they're trusted, now, the libraries are trusted, so if you can partner with People like that, I think you'll um, you'll do well in getting to the community you're trying to access. Because I know how hard it is, having a previous life as an academic, trying to get uh, the support. Um, and I'm so glad you've got some more funding because I know that's a real issue. Half of the issue of being an academic is to chase the funding. So um, that's really amazing. So thank you. I should mention that we're signing the paperwork now, actually, for phase two. And I'm not sure of the audience here, but if there are people in local government areas um, in South Australia at the moment, um, it's not too late for local governments to get involved and to sign up, or for participants to express their interest. So that's thank you. oh, that's wonderful. So um, uh, I think we've I don't know how many people we've got from South Australia, but anyway. People are going to um, listen to this later, and I'm sh hopefully we can get some more people from South Australia interested in your program. And then phase three, we're interested, but the rest of Australia will be interested as well, I'm sure. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And also, um, oh, I've got was one of our people has even put something in the chat. Um, Danielle Mari from um, Brimbank Libraries here in uh, Victoria saying she can put you in touch with a fantastic South Australian librarian. So there you go. Wonderful. Um, so Thank you. Please do. So I'll, I'll, pass that, uh, I'll pass that on, uh, Danielle, if you can um, give that e email, I'll, I'll uh, pass it through. And now, Last but not least is our uh, as the star uh, as one of the stars of the show, and that's uh, Benita Parsons, community learning leader, libraries at the City of Port Adelaide, Enfield, and we're happy to have Benita and her team as members of the ALCN. She has shared many stories in our newsletters and annual reports about her passion for supporting sustainability and reconciliation with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And uh, her CV is in the chat, so I won't need to go into that. And uh, Benita is talking about projects that uh, she is doing in this area. So over to you, Benita. Thanks, Leone. Um, yeah, there's lots of similarities between both what, what Sylvia and Kerry have, have spoken about. So I feel like we're really aligned in, in what we're doing here, which is great. So I wanted to just start briefly by looking at Port Adelaide Enfield as a broader organisation, um, kind of talking top down. So with our, our city vision has just been redone this year. Um, if we got on the next slide, thanks Sharon. Awesome. Um, we Our new kind of slogan, if you like, a, a welcoming living city made by people. And we've got four key pillars. And you'll notice that one of those is a clean green city. So I've just put that there on the screen to show a bit more detail around what that looks like and, and that um, tackling climate change and participating in a circular economy is really highlighted in at the top level for us as a council and for our city. And we're really modelling that and driving that change with our local industry and businesses and community to say this is really important. And here's some of the ways that we as an organisation are 
um, actioning it and hopefully modeling that behavior um, so the rest of the community can follow. Thanks, Sharon. So some of the paths towards that, um, our council elected members did declare a climate emergency back in 2019 and we joined a climate council cities power partnerships. We know um, renewable energy and electricity prices is a real challenge. Um, we also have targets around our tree canopy, um, trying to get it up to 30 or increase by 35 percent by 2050. But there's only so much that local government can do in terms of the, the land that we own with our parks and gardens and verges. So we also have a giveaway program for tree planting and provided 300 trees to residents. That should be residents with a T, not a C. Um, to give them give away trees that they can plant on their own properties, their front and backyards to help um, improve the tree canopy across our city. And that's been rolled out a couple of years now and definitely was very targeted the first year round of making sure people in particular suburbs where the canopy was lower, um, give them first dibs on the trees and then what went a bit wider the second time round. We also do have some coast that we look after. Um, so with um, semaphore and largs out of harbour um, around the Port Adelaide area, we do have beachfront and dunes and sand issues um, and lots of community groups that are now kind of friends of um, the dunes. So lots of little local groups that get together on a regular basis and um, look at the vegetation around their their little patch of of the beach which is um, really great to see and they are supported by council to do so we also have the river going through port adelaide um, some of that has mangroves in it um, which is a very fragile ecosystem so we we do um, put energy into looking after the mangroves that are in our city um, and as part of our living environment strategy or living environment program um, supporting climate change adaptation community environment action greening our city our, our coasts and waterways and supporting biodiversity you know we have a strategic action plan that covers all of those areas so um, there is a lot of work done across the whole council to look at um, looking after our, our patch of of this place we also have an integrated transport strategy encouraging active transport. Um, we do in, encourage um, cycling in particular. There is there is a, a, a outer harbour greenway that goes through Port Adelaide, so it's um, safer ways to ride between um, Port Adelaide and the Adelaide CBD without going on major roads. Um, so that's something that's been in place and is getting promoted and have some active bicycle user community groups. Thanks, Sharon. Um, further part of our um, living environment program is a net zero emissions plan and we do have a role that is focused on reducing the emissions of our organisation. So in the last couple of years we've installed solar panels on most if not all of our council buildings. Most if not all of our um, council pool cars have been switched over to EVs. Um, pretty quickly, I must say. It was only a couple of years ago that we had a couple of hybrid cars and one EV, and now all of the pool cars are, are EVs. So that's a learning for all staff to get to know about charging and driving electric car. Um, we have invested in our own recycling um, and materials recovery infrastructure in partnership with a neighbouring council, City of Charles Sturt. When that all um, kind of came to crisis a couple of years ago with lots of recycling just sitting in warehouses and not getting processed. Um, the, the CEOs of Charles Sturt and PAE got together and said, we need to deal with our waste ourselves. So they, um, we, we now have our own recycling plant where we can deal with our, our curbside waste um, and process those recyclables into materials that then we can reuse ourselves. Um, so that's um, something we're really proud of. 
We also um, do have a grant program to support other businesses in our area to improve um, their sustainability and be more green businesses. So that's some of the major work in in um, the council as a whole. As well as that, we have Adapt West. Um, thanks. Yep. So again, with City of Charleston, but also again Green Adelaide and the City of West Torrance. So going further down the coast um, on the western suburbs of Adelaide, um, a partnership there to look at how we can work together to look at the implications of climate change, particularly in that coastal region, um, respond to those challenges and build resilience. Um, so that project is a couple of years old and now moving more into um, a, an implementation, has had a little bit of a review, but now an implementation phase. Over the last few years, um, they had a number of community focused actions as well as more um, internal council actions that they were working on. Some of the community ones were around um, sustainable homes, so improving the thermal performance of your house and how to do that from an Adelaide perspective with our particular climate and needs. Um, so they were a series of webinars in 2023 and those recordings are still available on the Adapt West website. They also have a tool that's on the website um, to uh, My Cool Home to try and rate your the um, energy efficiency of your own home. And they also held a um, an event where they went through scenarios of what would happen in an extreme like bushfire or flooding or heat wave event. How can we be more prepared and what the community can do so that resilience um, in the face of extreme climate events or weather events um, was an event held at the Woodville Town Hall and was live streamed out um, to the broader community. So that's a few of the community education tools that we've um, been involved with in that partnership with other councils in the area. Next, we have more of the library program. So more of my um, direct area of, of responsibility. Um, three years ago, we started a program called Gen Green. Um, it was inspired or in response to the youth climate strikes with Greta um, and, you know, all of the um, energy that that young people were, you know, in protest and, you know, how dare we not be doing something about this? Um, so the question to my team was, well, how can we support those young people to be well informed and to feel hopeful and learn about what they can do and what they are advocating for? So we are very lucky to have a STEM edu edu educator. His name is David Riley. He is amazing. Um, he is one of two STEM programs and learning offices that we have at Port Adelaide Enfield Libraries. Um, David has designed and delivered this, this program for young people, so age 12 to 17 years. He brings the science um, to the table, um, but with a, you know, he's passionate about circular economy, he's passionate about ecology, he's passionate about sustainability. So he has lots of knowledge in this area. Um, and he's created monthly sessions where the young people can get really hands on with experiments and understand the science behind climate change and really understand um, what needs to be done and how then it, it impacts locally and globally. Um, he does reference the sustainable development goals and, um, as Kerry had mentioned, the planetary boundaries. boundaries. Um, so bringing those together for the young people to, to understand. Um, so there's a couple of photos there from learning about um, temperature rise and also a session where they built some terrariums to understand planetary closed systems. So um, next slide. Thank you, Sharon. In this year, David has redesigned, redesigned the, the program slightly. So he's gone a little bit away from the science and a little bit more into the positive messaging. Um, 
to really show what has been done and some examples of what I've already talked about at our council level, making sure that the young people are aware that these things are happening and there is progress being made and really saying, here's what we're getting right. Here's where the targets were headed three years ago. Here's what the projections are now. It's still not good, but it's better than what it was. Um, so, um, you know, that's part of the, the setting of those conversations. And then again, a, a wide range of hands-on activities around recycling, energy, um, I think this month is the session around urban design and city planning. So they'll do some designs and some Lego. Um, look at you know what does that look like in your own 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 city. Um, they've um, done uh, some nature walks and some citizen science, and also talking about the right to repair, um, which links to the repair cafe that we hold every month at the Parks Library. So linking to a lot of other things that are happening, but bringing it down to hands-on activities that the young people can join in with. Um, the pictures there from a rigid plastic recycling session held um, in the last couple of months. So for 2025, um, next slide, thank you, awesome. This is some of what David is planning to deliver. Um, he's got so many ideas, so just looking at the different topics around, again, microplastics, um, permaculture, we do have a seed library collection at one of our libraries, so we're link linking back to that as well. We do have an Internet of Things or IoT experimenters group for adults that meet monthly at Parks Library, so running a special session for the young people around how to use sensors and, and sense um, get data on the microclimates. Um, Yipiyar to Pultuku, the regulars of this network will have heard me talk about that before, is the new um, Aboriginal Cultural Centre currently under construction and literally the building is coming out of the ground and the landscaping is happening right now. We're looking at opening in March-ish next year. Um, part of Yipiyar to Pultuku is reconnecting to the Port River where it had been all um, walls and you know lots of um, retaining walls and things around the edges of the river so you can't actually get down to the water from from the shoreline um, the new design there is a living shoreline so you will see the tidal properties of the port river because it is tidal and um, they will reinstate some mangroves and you will have, be able to access the river from from this um, park so um, David's hoping to have a session there to be able to be hands on um, connecting to country and Ghana country and education, but also then connecting to that Port River and living shoreline. So that's some of the things he has planned for next year to show you all the different little bite sized pieces um, to pull together and get them both in the library and out of the library, um, seeing what what um, can be done in our own little environment. Um, some other programs that happen across Port Adelaide Enfield other than Gen Green. Um, we, I've mentioned that we do have climate sensors at our five libraries and that microclimate data is available open source to anyone who wants to access it. We do have a, a regular repair cafe. Um, we do have nature walks and have done a couple of nature walks through Folland Park, which is a, a very small patch of remnant bushland right in the middle of the suburbs of Enfield. Um, so Folland Park is closed to the public generally. It's fenced and locked, but it's protected. Um, and we do have a group of volunteers that maintain the biodiversity in that park. And we occasionally have special tours that go go through um, to show people this is what's here and it's, and it's very special. Uh, we do have a small group of volunteers that also um, do monitoring of birds, vegetation and site restoration across six key sites in the city as that flora and fauna monitoring project. Um, and one other nice little ongoing program is our Little Greenies after school craft program that's at the Semaphore Library. That's more about 
kind of craft but using natural materials or making DIY gifts but uh, you know just again little ways of how in your own home you can have a slightly lighter footprint. Um, picture there is of our observational beehive at the Enf Enfield Library um, that was there for three years or so. Unfortunately this year it had to be removed due to varroa mite that is spreading across the country and it's no longer viable to have an, an, um, a beehive inside. Um, so we don't have the bees anymore but we do still have uh, native bee hotels outside and we do also do workshops um, building nesting boxes for creatures such as microbats. Um, so our STEM team are very busy in this sustainability space um, uh, and both Robert and David are very passionate about this. Um, so we we tap into their skills as makers and scientists and um, bring that community education um, and fun hands-on workshops all together. That is my speedy talk. Leonie, you're muted. Put the microphone on, yes. There we go. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Benita, and I'm sorry I didn't um, uh, um, leave you enough time. And um, But we've had a great discussion through this thing, and we've, we've answered questions as well, and they're very similar, uh, similar uh, projects uh, but much more detailed, and I'm a member of a weeding group in our local community too, so I think the importance of doing that can't be underestimated, and all of the, as Kashish said in the chat, that um, providing practical um, activities for young people is so important to get them involved and find out what they can do in their own community, and I think you've, you've demonstrated that by a whole range of, of things. We're running out of time for questions but we've been go having questions as we've um, uh, been going and I wondered if uh, people could, because uh, Kashi's put so much time into designing the cementing meter activity, I wonder if we could now go straight into that. Good idea. Thanks Leonie. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. All right. Uh, is it visible to everyone? Yes. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kasha Chopra, and I will be taking you all through a brief reflective activity that will help us reflect on the key takeaways from our wonderful presenters about today's topic. So to participate in this activity, I would like to request you all to take out your phones and scan the QR code visible on your screens or you could also log on to www.menti.com and enter the code 6222653 to join us. And once you're in, I would really appreciate it if everyone could click on the thumbs up that's on the bottom right corner of your screen so that I know that everyone is in and then we could head straight into the questions. Just gonna give it a couple of seconds. All right, so the first question here asks you to reflect on the three presentations and share one idea about climate resilience, sustainability and regeneration that stood out as the most important for you. PAH and Green Program, definitely. Someone said the underlying message I got was to involve the community in education, in educating them and for them to participate. That hope is important and go for the long term. Community education can empower individuals to take collective action, driving sustainability through local initiatives. Educating the young people is very important. People will commit to 12 month programs. All right, so we'll move on to the next question since we're cutting very close on time. 
So the second question here urges you to reflect on some of the direct actions you might take based on some of the ideas you've heard about today. Please feel free to mention more than one. Organizing discussions with sustainable teams to see if we can do something similar. Engaging and promoting widely with local community programs, promoting sustainability, best practices, and initiatives focused on building climate resilience. Consistently volunteering at the local community garden. We will definitely be sharing the recording with everyone. Keep capturing and sharing stories. I was inspired with the Gen Green program. I'm going to speak to our events team to try and engage our youth urban forest building with community engagement. All right, and with that, I think I'll move on to the final question. So the final question here is a very important one in terms of taking action on climate resilience. The Learning City or the Learning Community Movement is collaborative. That is that we can achieve more through partnerships. So for this part, we would like you to think about any local groups that you can work with to build this resilience. Um, it might be your local government or local libraries, uh, any non-for-profit sustainability or environmental groups, cultural groups, or even adult and community education. Mm -hmm. And you're welcome to respond with more than one groups that you could think of. Local botanical gardens. Youth representatives. Neighbor houses, local businesses, business associations, trees for life, local government, Libraries, we have a community garden run by volunteers they will be interested to partner with. Council actions, including community participation. Construction industry to embed sustainable design. Since we are cutting pretty close to the time allotted, I won't be able to read through all the wonderful responses from everyone, but we will be sharing the slides with you all later on to go through. And with that being said, I would also like to acknowledge that these are some really great and thoughtful reflections. So thank you everyone for your valuable inputs today. And I will now hand back to Dr. Leonie Wheeler to summarize. Um, thank you very much, uh, Kashish, and I'm sorry, I think I let everyone speak too long, but that was a uh, um, problem, uh, a good problem to have because the uh, presentations were so interesting, and I think you will see that they linked together, they linked from Sylvia's work in the early stages of um, talking about just a learning festival and short-term actions but thinking about the challenges first and doing quite a lot of planning in that learning festival and wanting long-term solutions. And then Kerry came up and gave us some long-term um, programs that we could all hook into in the long-term, which was wonderful. And, and it's so nice to hear a, a positive academic doing that kind of work 
out of the university system and working with community and wanting to work with community in the future. And, and, um, and the audience have come up with some, um, some contacts for you in South Australia, which is good. And hopefully stage three, you'll, you'll actually have um, some of us, our communities will want to partner with you as well. And then Benita followed it all on, on with um, a lot of the work that we hear about every day, but that youth, the young people's um, work, the STEM activity, um, getting young people involved is so important, as well as the normal work that local government try, uh, does. Does anyone else want to just um, come in and say something? Um, and it looks like Danielle's already emailed um, me with a contact for you, Kerry, so you'll be hearing soon. Sylvia, do you want to say anything to finish? Oh, I just would love to have these conversations more and more often. I think we just have to also keep having them and scaling projects like Kerry's and piloting them in Victoria and I love the idea of the STEM educators being um, doing sustainability work as well in Adelaide. So yes, we, we just have to keep talking and sharing. And Kerry, a final word from you? Yeah, just thank you to everyone for the amazing work that you're doing. I was really inspired by all the other presenters and so great to hear about Jen Green and what a fantastic festival and um, thank you for organising this session because, yeah, connection is key. Um, you know, a lot of time can be lost in trying to reinvent the wheel and the more we can collaborate, the better we're going to be, um, the faster action can happen and um, the more regenerative the journey will be as well. So thank you all for the opportunity. It's great to be here. And, and Benita? Uh, look, I, I just was really pleased to be able to bring um, all of these pieces of the puzzle together and yeah really excited with Kerry's work and hope that we can be part of that future phases two and three um, and really appreciate um, that we are all aligned in our values and goals and and supporting each other in this journey. Well that's a very positive note to end and I just thank you very much and uh, we've got some positive feedback from our chats as well so um, well done, everyone. And Kashish, I really appreciate the work that you put into the Mentimeter and trying to get us through it in a short time. I'm very yeah. apologetic about that, but I think you got some good responses anyway. Yes, definitely. Thanks, Kashish. And thanks to Benita for, um, I guess, being the lead on this one and organising it. It was Absolutely. you know, incredible to hear from you, Kerry, and as Leonie said, to have an academic um, and really share some insights. And um, it's, it's very valuable from, from a learning practitioner point of view um, and even you know from state to state, it differs, but there's also just some common goals. And I just think to have that sharing of knowledge and resources and, and to continue the conversation is really important. So. Um, you know, just a huge thank you to, to everybody. Thank you. I'll stop recording now.